Hello, my name is Professor Vanilla Randall at the University of Dayton School of Law. I'm Professor Emeritus there, and I'm going to do a mini lecture on whether or not the out-of-school suspensions of Dayton of uh, black children are lawful. I have been working on this issue of the school to prison pipeline by focusing on uh, one of the early points in the pipeline, that is the suspension of children uh, from school, the out of school suspension of children from school. I mostly place my focus on uh, working to educate the community uh, and also on working to get the uh, a moratorium both at the state and federal level on uh, zero tolerance policy and on um, out of school suspensions. However, recently I was asked by the NAACP uh, Legal Affairs uh, Committee uh, to give a small lecture uh, for their group and to focus on the legal aspect. And being a lawyer, I readily agreed. Uh, and so this is this lecture is a focus on uh, what is the whether or not the suspensions are legal in my opinion as a lawyer you have to start the, the discussion of whether something is legal or not always discuss with what law are you talking about are you talking about a state civil rights act are you talking with about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, you have to be specific by, about the law that you're using because in order to determine whether or not something is legal, you have to know what the elements are that must be proven or disproven. In this case, I'm going to use the Title VI uh, uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That act uh, made uh, discrimination uh, based on race by any organization that received federal funds illegal. Uh, there is, uh, a, in generally, the law makes intentional acts illegal by interpretation. The law itself doesn't limit itself to intentional acts, but the court has limited to intentional act. By regulation, uh, the courts have, indi ha um, excuse me, the uh, law has been included to co cover what's uh, called disparate impact. Disparate impact are those things that are not intentionally done but have a racially discriminatory effect. One of the problems with this law is that this aspect of the law is that courts have held that uh, individuals cannot sue for dis disparate impact. All they can do is file a complaint with an agency. However, the federal government has indicated through their guidance that they put out that they would entertain complaints to them uh, about uh, disparate impact on indiscipline. So there's a window of opportunity right now. The window of opportunity is we have a federal agency who is interested in the uh, discriminatory impact of, uh, of, of disciplinary policies. So the elements, sort of like I would teach this class, there are basically uh, four elements 
and elements can be broken up in you could say three in terms of how you break them up so is there a method of discipline that is racially neutral on its face does that method of discipline in terms of its implementation have a discriminatory effect if so you at that pow at that point it may be found unlawful if there is not a sufficient justification for doing it one justification would be that it's educationally necessary even if that it's shown to be educational necessary it can still be unlawful if there are equally effective and less discriminatory alternatives available. Now, this most of this lecture is based on a wonderful article done by Daniel Lawson, Discipline Policies, Successful Schools, uh, Racial uh, Justice and the Law. Uh, the article is on uh, my website, racism.org. I highly encourage you to go to that article and read it. So the first step, is there a discriminatory effect? We the, the racial neutral policy that we are looking at is out of school suspensions. If you look at code of conduct, if you look at it's what written on their on their face, they're racially neutral. I am going to use Dayton, Ohio statistics because I am heavily involved in uh, Dayton, Ohio uh, campaign to get things changed. But it should be known that Dayton statistics are not the worst. Uh, uh, and that's a good thing to cause because if they're not the worst, think about uh, you can think about how bad is it getting. Uh, Dayton is probably in the middle of the pack of urban schools in Ohio. Uh, it's probably uh, in the middle of the pack for uh, charter schools, uh, both. Uh, there are both public schools and charter schools that have worse statistics. But nevertheless, data, uh, Dayton uh, provides us a good opportunity to take a look at this. So the thing right now, we're just looking, is there a discriminatory effect? That is intentionally or not, are black kids being treated differently than other kids in the implementation of the suspension, out of school suspensions? Now, these numbers are rate per 100 kids. This a rate allows you to compare popu different population sizes. So, for instance, 65% of Dayton's population is black. So, if you just compared occurrences, you would expect more occurrences uh, in Dayton. However, what a rate does is translate, makes a unit number that can be compared. And so no matter what the size of population, you, if there's not something else going on, you would be expecting about the same rate per hundred in different population size. And you don't see that with Dayton. Uh, black students have a rate of 60.6 .6, uh, per 100 and Asian students which have the lowest have 8.3. 
that is black students are 7.3 times has 7.3 times more suspensions per hundred now this is not the percent of students that get suspended uh, I don't have that number because it's not available on the on the data that I use we use 2012 2013 discipline reports Ohio advanced report data um, and they don't release the percent uh, of students and the percent of students would tell you the actual risk that a particular student has to get uh, to getting suspended because it tells you the number of students that get at least one for uh, uh, one suspension nevertheless the number of suspensions per hundred students tells us that there is a racial disparity here. We see that boys are, are more uh, black boys are five point have five point one times more suspensions uh, 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 per hundred students. And surprisingly, the, while the number of suspensions per 100 students are lower than black boys, you see here 43 per 100 students for black girls, 77.2 per 100 students for black boys. The, the uh, black girls are 43 times more excuse me four have 43 times more suspensions per hundred uh students uh and so they're they are actually at greater risk they have great greater suspensions uh as compared to their their gender group so both black girls and black boys are have a uh, racially disparate uh, a discriminatory in, uh, suspensions so uh, now I know what someone's gonna say because I hear it in their head well isn't that about economics isn't it that there are more black poor blacks and poor blacks comes from uh, a, a uh, environment that makes them higher at risk behavior wise and so consequently uh, that would explain lucky for us they, uh, the Ohio actually collects economic disadvantage data and we can compare that and what we see is yes, blacks who are economic disadvantage have a higher uh, out of school suspension rate than, uh, uh, than anyone else, anyone else. And so does multiracial uh, uh, children. But here's the surprise. Blacks who are not economically disadvantaged. Hear what I'm saying? Blacks and multiracial kids who are not economically disadvantaged have a higher rate of suspension than everyone but the uh, blacks who are economically disadvantaged. They have a higher rate of suspension than whites who who are economic disadvantaged and they have a higher rate of suspension, much higher rate of suspension than whites who are not economically disadvantaged. In fact, blacks who are not economically disadvantaged have twice as many out of school suspensions than whites who are not economically disadvantaged and they have a significantly difference than whites who are economically disadvantaged. So while economics makes a difference, race also makes a difference. And so the racial disparity continues to exist 
even in the face of economic disadvantage. Another issue that I think you should take a look at is what's happening to disabled kids because that's another area of law that we're not going to look at. Uh, there's all kinds of disability law that controls uh, what can happen with disabled kids. And what we see is black disabled kids are at a greater risk. Uh, kindergartners, uh, black disabled kindergartners are 39.1 times more have, excuse me, have 30 times, point one times more suspensions. And it goes on. So one question you ha need to ask yourself if you're talking about wanting to look at the law is, is your school system adequately protecting the rights of disabled black children? Uh, but we're not going to look at disability law now. Um, So what we've essentially established that there's a discriminatory effect being, that happens in terms of how uh, Dayton Public School is implementing its uh, uh, out of school suspension policy. Okay. And I suspect that you'll find that uh, in, in almost every school, the data supports that. And uh, one of the things it's in, I have found it important to get into the specific data uh, and not use national data. Now, it, we are, Ohio is one of the places that provides a lot of data on its website, uh, Ohio Edu Department of Education. Uh, some districts doesn't, don't provide that information. So, uh, this disparate dis disciplinary action, this discrimination, discriminatory effects, could be unlawful if they are not edu if it, if they are not educationally necessary. A sufficient justification. What would be the sufficient justification? That is educationally necessary, and no one would argue with that. That if in fact and not just education for that individual child, education for the school district to be able to provide a, uh, uh, an educational environment, then uh, you would say, okay, um, this is what happens. It would be educationally ne necessary if in fact black students were behave worse behaved. And so that the reason why there are more out of school suspensions for black students is not because uh, they are applying the, uh, the policy in a discriminatory way, but because black students are in fact behaving worse. Now the data says that that's not, that's not the problem that when you uh, control for severity of illness, I uh, mean, excuse me, um, thinking back to my other hat, which is healthcare, when you control for severity of of, uh, of behavior, what you find is that black kids are disciplined more harshly for the same behavior. Uh, that the difference in s suspension rates is really housed in the philosophy of the principal and the administrators because those are the two people that have a check on what the teacher does and so that you can get some schools like in our we have one school this school in our our area westwood that in 2012 had 88 uh suspensions per 100 kids and we had another school Lou, louise troy who had 11 suspensions per 100 kids. Those schools are on the same side of town, serve the same population group. Uh, and so the, the behavior uh, should, can't be explained by that. 
but can be explained by what the principal is doing and what the school district is doing. And, and in fact, I think that holds true in Dayton because uh, when we talked with uh, different people in the administration, we were told that principals were given a lot of leeway in how they implemented uh, the code of conduct. Um, but I think there's other data that in Dayton, at least, that supports the idea that um, that's, uh, black kids are being disciplined more harshly for the same behavior. When we looked at uh, discipline uh, in 2012 by the types of behavior that was being disciplined, <laughs> we found the most amazing information, disturbing information. This chart shows the grade level and the discipline category in which there were only black kids suspended. That is no Asian, no white, no Hispanic, no multiracial, only black kids suspended. Uh, you, can see it, you can see that uh, Fighting and violence, only black kids in the first, second, and third grade. Uh, the one that I found that most disturbing for me is ha harassment and intimidation. Because it seems to be a label that's being put on, only on black kids. Every grade level except second and seventh grade. And second grade had no suspensions in that grade level. Seventh grade had some suspensions of white kids in that level. But every grade, every other grade level, up to 10th grade, black kids are the only kids being suspended for harassment and intimidation. Now, I'm thinking back to when I... Uh, uh, when I grew up, and I I grew up in the 40s and the 50s, and I remember my foster mother saying to me in the 60s, I remember my foster mother, my foster mother who was college educated but worked clean houses, and and that wasn't unusual because uh, many blacks, uh, most blacks who got a college education found that there were no jobs at that time, which is working hard, but not no jobs for the college educated. So she cleaned house and she would come home and she would constantly say to us, white kids don't do this. White kids don't run in the house. White kids uh, don't leave vegetables on their plate. White kids don't shout. Whatever behavior she didn't like in us, it was why kids don't. Why kids don't do that. And you would begin to believe that white kids were perfect. And based on this data, you would begin to believe that black kids are horrible because they're the only ones doing the fighting and the violence, the harassment and the intimidation, the use of drugs, the use of tobacco, and I just don't believe that. I believe that they that this supports what other research has shown. That black kids are being are engaged in the same behavior that other kids are engaged in, but they are being disciplined more harshly and more frequently for that behavior and other discipline methods than out of school suspension is being used for the other students. So, it is not educational necessary because black kids are behaving more in a way that requires it. Um, I wanna go back just a second. The other th educational necessary is preschool to third grade suspension should be uh, 
educationally unnecessary, even if black kids were behaving more, uh, 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 were worse behaved. Because all of the developmental sciences say that, uh, that suspending preschool through third grade is developmentally inappropriate. So, uh, and as we can see, Blacks have some significant more suspensions in those grade levels than whites. So what are some of the other reasons that are used to justify it say that uh, it's, it's educationally necessary? One justification is getting the parents' attention and active involvement. Certainly, that would be the ideal. If suspensions heighten the parental awareness of what's going on and got them more actively involved that that certainly would be a reason to say that uh, uh, that they were educationally necessary but the reality is that uh, uh, the behavior often can be a signal that uh, there's something going on at home that is at the root of the problems, especially for the very young children. Uh, and so suspending them to home doesn't provide any assurances that the parents are going to get, have any heightened awareness. And in fact, the problem becomes that parents Many parents of every educational economic, uh, and economic background are so overextended that a suspended child uh, only becomes a stressor. It doesn't become something that really st uh, that they can engage in. They uh, don't take off of work to be with that child. They put that child in uh, daycare or worse, they have a older uh, uh, sibling stay home from school or they in fact, uh, ha the child stays home alone. So uh, um, it's, it it's, may not be an effective and if getting attention is one of the things we want to do, there's certainly less extreme approaches than uh, out of school suspension to get parents' attention. Certainly not an educational necess necessity for the child because if in fact uh, the home is a stressor, uh, then uh, suspension, yes, becomes just another uh, another stressor. Uh, and so it's an in a, uh, out of school suspension is in a, is an ineffective way of getting parents' attention and active involvement. The other reason that is often uh, provided is to provide a deterrence for other students uh, and uh, and to deter future behavior. So if that's in fact what happens, if, if we want to deter future behavior, what you would expect to see is, is that the, uh, the behavior, uh, the child would come back from detention with improved behavior uh and uh and what you see is that there's no evidence that uh that those children actually change their behavior uh it doesn't there's no evidence in that it does anything to improve safety which is another issue 
um, the people gifts uh, to ensure safety of the children. And so children uh, come back to school uh, and they actually get more suspensions. And it may be that one of the re reasons that occurs is because if some children, uh, especially children who are left home alone and children who are, uh, are left home with an older sibling may find that preferable to being in school and dealing with the school environment. And there's no research evidence that uh, suspending one child defers another child from the behavior. In fact, One of the um, one issue that people constantly raise up is safety of children and staff, and that might be a good uh, reason, and that might it would be a good reason if in fact children came back with change behavior. So if you got a child that bites, you've got a child that kids, if you have a child that throws temper tantrums and throws things, if you suspend them and when they come back, they no longer do those things, that, that would definitely be a point of ensuring safety of children and staff. But those children come back with those same behaviors. And so the out-of-school suspensions is ineffective for ensuring safety of children and staff because the only thing that's going to ensure safety in children and staff is to make changes in that child behavior. And, and the school is the place where that can occur. Finally, uh, along with that goes ensuring that uh, is conductive to teaching uh, and it's true that uh, some students need to be taken out of the classroom because of the disruptiveness of their behavior but that doesn't mean that need to be suspended from school there are alternatives that would allow uh, the classroom to continue and move forward while the child to receive uh, help, uh, other additional help. Plus, there's research that shows uh, that uh, putting a different, the same student in different classrooms uh, tend to uh, in decrease the disruptions. Um, because uh, the the to some extent the the skill of the teacher is an issue as to how disruptive a, a child's behavior is. As engagement goes up, as teaching engagement go up, classroom disruptive behavior goes down. So to the extent that a teacher or a class or a school is having a significant problem with disruptive behavior, the question might be, are those are they really engaging the students uh, in a way that needs to be engaged? So you can say, you can see from my discussion that I don't believe that out of school suspensions can be justified as an educational necessity. And without that justification, uh, anywhere there's a discriminatory effect, they would be unlawful. But even if justified, a school district may still legally need to change if there's a less discriminatory alternative. And so the question is, 
Are there less discriminatory alternatives? And the answer is yes. Start with the fact that out of school suspensions are ineffective for changing behavior and that they are educationally harmful. They, uh, when you start there, then you have to look, okay, what alternatives that are more effective in changing behavior and less educationally harmful? And we have uh, system-wide positive behavior interventions and support. We have restorative justice, peer mediation, an early childhood intervention and referral team, um, and support and training for teachers, uh, including classroom management, uh, culturally competent teaching, and bias-free discipline. One or all of those in combination can are better alternatives to uh, uh, suspension to out of school suspension. I want to talk a minute. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, because there's plenty of in information on the internet and I wanted to keep this kind of short and it's already at 50, uh, 40 minutes but I want to talk about the difference between culturally competent teaching and bias free discipline because there is a difference but implicit bias you can have implicit bias in the way you judge people and still have and still do culturally competent teaching Culturally competent teaching is about uh, integrating differences about culture and recognizing differences in cultural needs and, and, and integrating it into your teaching. Even a culturally competent teacher can have implicit biases that have them look negatively or positively. For instance, 80% uh, of whites have a pro-white bias so that when they look at whites, they judge whites' behavior in a much positive way than when they look at non-whites. By the same token, just hiring blacks of people of color won't get, rid of, get you a bias-free discipline because 30 to 40 percent of blacks have a pro-white bias. Bias to get rid of bias-free discipline, you will have to uh, they they will have to implement alternatives that and training that actually deals with bias and not just with cultural competency. And just getting rid of suspensions won't get rid of bias-free discipline. Whatever is implemented, I think Cincinnati is evidence of that. Uh, Cincinnati has one of the lowest suspension rates in the state, uh, 2.9 or something per 100. And yet when you look at their other disciplinary methods, they continue to have uh, a discriminatory uh, effect in their other disciplines. And that's because they continue to have bias, uh, ba bias discipline. You have to actually work on getting rid of bias-free discipline um, and not just uh, to get rid of the discriminatory effect in other disciplinary methods. And the question you might ask is, is why then focus on out-of-school suspensions at all? And that's because out-of-school suspensions are harmful in a way that other disciplinary methods are not. Out-of-school suspensions, uh, more than peer mediate, has uh, is the leading indication of academic difficulty, which of course that makes perfect sense. 
If you're suspending a child, even for one day, they're missing that lesson for that day. And if they have repeated the suspension, then it's all accumulative. And at some point, it accumulates enough where they drop out of school and and, and eventually uh, the future incarceration. So this is how it all connects to the school to prison pipeline. So, under Title VI, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Disparate Impact Theory, does the practice of out-of-school suspensions have a discriminatory effect? The answer for Dayton is yes. You would have to look at the data in your uh, school district to be able to answer that question. If you answer no to that question, then the rest of the questions are irrelevant. Stop. You don't you can't even go you can't go anywhere with it. Once you answer yes, the question is the practice educational necess is the practice educational necessity. I believe the answer to that question is no. But even if the answer is yes, there's still the question, is there equally effective, less discriminatory alternatives? Now, let me go back to the second question. If the practice is not educational necessary, then it doesn't matter whether they're equally effective, less discriminatory alternatives. If the practice is not educational necessary, then the practice should stop, period. Doesn't matter what alternatives there are. The only time when the issue of alternatives come into play is, is if you say they that the practice is educationally necessary. In that point, you ask the question, well, are there equally effective less discriminatory alternatives. And since, and the answer to that question is yes, there are equally effective, less discriminatory uh, alternatives available. So any school district who has this array of answers to these questions should be looking at making changes. Part of the problem is is that that uh, oftentimes school districts are not proactive in 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 doing wanting to do this, and it often takes the, the an actual legal suit or complaint to the um, uh, to the uh, the Department of Education. Because remember what I told you at the very beginning, the way the law is set up now, you cannot file a lawsuit under this theory. All you can do is to file a complaint with the uh, Department of Education. So you should consider whether or not you it's in your uh, strategy to file a complaint. Or do you think things are so bad is the school board and our school district so non-responsive to this issue that you think that only a complaint uh, with the uh, Department of Education? I would encourage you to not sit too long on that. Uh, in terms of whether you think that is an issue, because uh, we have a friendly Department of Justice now. Uh, in two years, uh, we will have, uh, we may have another administration. Well, we definitely will have another administration. It won't be the Obama administration. Uh, and that means whether it's Democrat or Republican, that they may have different priorities. Right now, this is a priority for the Obama administration, so it may be something that you will want to consider, actively consider.
activists working on eliminating school pushouts should use the disparate impact standard of law review as grounds to pursue remedies for the unjust and unnecessary removal of black children from school. Please take a look at Daniel uh, Lawson's article. I think you'll find it very detailed and very informative. Thank you.